You might remember that old saw that says familiarity breeds contempt. In theology and Bible study, familiarity doesn't really always breed contempt as much as it sometimes breeds carelessness. We assume that we know what a text means because we've known that text all of our lives and we've always thought that it means this. And so we become careless and we just assume well, it must mean what I always heard it preached or what I've always assumed that it meant. And we never stop to verify and study and examine the meaning. When we approach the table of the Lord, we tend to make assumptions about what the Lord's Supper means. And sometimes there are problems with our familiarity. Sometimes it becomes apathy, and that is not something we should ever be when we come to the table of the Lord, is apathetic. You know, it's the first Sunday of the month, it's the Lord's Supper, let's get it done, ho-hum. Please, if you have a ho-hum attitude towards the Lord's Supper, just pass it by. <laughs> I don't mean that flippantly either, but uh, for some, depending on the tradition that you're raised in, the Lord's Supper is a sacrament, and they believe that somehow it bestows grace, that it bestows favor with God. Uh, others, and this is where I was for much of my life, we see the Lord's Supper as a time for deep, personal self-reflection, where you privately and personally consider your relationship with Christ before you eat of the bread and drink of the cup. You know, you repent of any sin that you might have, and you renew your relationship with Christ. And this is part of the Lord's Supper. But it is only part of the meaning of the Lord's Supper. Now, a few moments ago, I read in entirety 1 Corinthians 11, 17-34, which is the most extensive treatment of the Lord's Supper other than what the Gospels say about it. And in that, we see the full orb of the meaning and purpose of the Lord's Supper. Now, when Paul wrote this passage, you can see that there are some dangers that he addresses in this passage. The Lord's Supper is the most holy and powerful time in the life of the church. And some of his statements give us pause. When I was a little kid, my dad would preach on this passage, and he'd say things, some of these things, and there would be times I'd be like, oh, I don't want to take that. I'd actually pass the elements by at times. Even though I'd been saved and baptized and I was, you know, I was able to take the elements of the Lord's Supper, but I would just let it pass by because I'm like, that's scary. You know, I don't want to mess with that stuff. L look at what verse 17 says. It says, I, your worship at the Lord's table is not for the better, but for the worse. That's hard for us to believe, isn't it? It says, it does more spiritual harm than good when you observe communion. Do you believe that? That Paul is saying when you go to the table of the Lord, it's worse than if you didn't go at all. You know, God is not some needy beggar who will accept the scraps of our lives. Isaiah 1, 10 through 19 makes it clear that God does not accept it, our worship, when we just go through the motions without humble hearts, passionate hearts, worshiping hearts. Now, in verse 20, Paul makes another statement here. He says, it is not the Lord's Supper that you're observing. Basically, he's saying, if you do it wrong, you can eat the bread and drink the cup, but you're not really doing it. You're not, if you're not doing it right, it's not the Lord's Supper. Unless your heart is right, it's not really the Lord's Supper. It's not real. And then, of course, there's the biggie. Verses 29 and 30. The offense they were guilty of was so serious that Paul said that their celebration of communion had actually brought God's judgment on them. Now, this is the one that used to scare me. It said some of them had been weak and sick because of this judgment and some of them had actually died i remember a time or two that like the week after communion i got sick and i'm like oh you know what did i do uh, but it's kind of scary isn't it to think that 
that they were doing communion, and I'm not making this up because you can read the passage. I mean, it's very clear in there. Because of the way they were abusing the table of the Lord, people in the church were getting sick, and Paul said a few of them had even died. Now, if it's that serious, we need to know what was going on in Corinth, and we need to not do it. Can we agree on that? (laughs) We need to not, what they were doing in Corinth, we need to not do. So what was the problem? We would expect Paul to say, at least the way, I don't know about you, but the way I was raised, to say, well, there are these sins in your life, immorality, drunkenness, pervert, whatever the sin is, and you're not confessing your sins before you take the Lord's Supper. That's what I was always kind of thinking I had to do. And I think you should have personal interaction, you know, personal inspection, int- introspection was the word I was trying to get at there. You should do that, and you should confess your sins. But that's not what Paul is talking about here. Verse 18 gives the diagnosis of the problem. He says, there are divisions among you. The problem was that they were coming to the table of the Lord divided. The church was divided. They had bitter hearts towards one another. The word here, you can probably figure out kind of the meaning of the word it's schismata schismata and it means tears or cracks there were tears and cracks and divisions schisms in the body of christ corinth was a church that was divided among social and economic lines and these were being reflected in the way that they observed communion to celebrate the lord's supper while participating in schism is not It is a serious offense in the body of Christ. Listen, a church that is divided, that's fighting, should just leave the trays for the Lord's Supper in the cupboard and not bring them out. Because it was observing the Lord's Supper in a way that reflected division that caused God to bring judgment on that church. The motivation for this is found in verse 19. It said these factions, and this word is that factions is a different word. It's the word we get our word heresy from. Eresis, and and, and it's the idea that there was these different groups that kind of said, we're better than you are. We have these special beliefs that make us superior to you. We know more than you know. We're better. And Paul is sarcastic here when he says that, of course you have to have these factions so you can show who has the truth. Paul always taught there's one body in Christ. One bo- Jesus died for one body. And he's saying, you factions, you gotta, you got to show, hey, we're the, we have the truth, and your group doesn't have the truth like we do. This is so I, just built in. It's, it's endemic to human nature To kind of say, my group is better than your group. This is why we get so passionate about our sports teams. I mean, it really is. I mean, I like my teams. But just because somebody cheers for a different team than I do doesn't make me a better person than they are. But we kind of act like that, don't we? I mean, we get so... I want my team to beat somebody else's team. But honestly, because that's just the way we are. We, we get in these factions, and you know, when it's sports, it doesn't really matter. I mean, we, we, can, we can cheer for different sports teams and still love each other, right? Unless it's the Red Sox. <laughs> See, I, just, I was going okay until I said that, but uh, uh, I was doing okay until that, till that I, had to, I had to throw that in there. I, but factions have no place in the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus died for one body, not a bunch of individuals or a cluster of cliques. And clickage, I don't even think that's a word, but clickage has no place in the body of Christ. Now what was the Corinthian crime? I'm going to explain it as best I can, and I'm going to to be a little absurd here, but they celebrated the Lord's Supper in large homes. Now the way these homes were built, there was an outer courtyard, often like an, uh, uh, they'd come in and there'd be a, a large courtyard surrounded by homes. 
And then there'd be an inner dining room, a fairly decent sized dining room. But what would happen? And there were two parts to the supper. There was the agape, the love feast. And then there was the Eucharist, that means Thanksgiving, but that was where they shared the bread and the cup. So they all would come in and they have this large love feast, which was meant to draw the whole body of Christ together, and then they'd share the, love, and then they'd share the Eucharist or the, uh, uh, the, the Lord's Supper. Rich people didn't have to work so hard. And so they were able to arrive early and generally they were invited into the inner dining room. And they had steak and caviar, you know, and baby back ribs and all the really fancy food. And the poor people, when they were finished with their long day of work, they were, they had, you know, the beans and weenies and cream of wheat and stuff. They had that out in the, in the outer courtyard. And so the rich folks were enjoying themselves and the fancy food in the inner room, and the poor people were out in the outer courtyard. And so they were celebrating the Lord's Supper in a way that divided the rich and the poor. That, that said, we're better than you are. And the people that came early, the rich folks, they were filling themselves to the gill, evidently. Uh, they weren't using Welch's grape juice in their communion because they were getting drunk and the people out the, the people that came late they they you know didn't have as much they got the leftovers and then they were celebrating the lord's supper in a way that said to the poor people you don't matter as much as we do now obviously again this is a bit of an exaggeration but it, it, it it's a it's basically what happened the rich got the best and the poor got the leftovers. And Paul said this angered God so much that he actually brought physical judgment on the people of Corinth. And the supper that they celebrated was not the Lord's Supper and the judgment fell on them. Now listen, there is no place where equality is meant to matter more than the foot of the cross. Rich people and poor people are absolutely the same when they're kneeling at the cross of Christ asking for the forgiveness of sin. White, black, Asian, Hispanic, Arab, there is no difference when you're on your knees begging Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Men have no advantage over women at the cross. Young and old, it doesn't matter. Talented, talentless, famous, nobodies. Human differences mean nothing when we stand before Christ or kneel at the cross. All have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. And we all need the grace that only Jesus Christ can provide through His blood shed at the cross. The church of Jesus Christ is united by one thing and one thing only. And the sad fact is that churches of Jesus Christ have been united by many other human things. But we are meant to be united by one thing and one thing only, that we have been saved by the blood of Christ. We have been to Jesus for His saving grace. We are washed in the blood of the Lamb. The only thing that matters in the church is how much you have grown in Jesus Christ. I remember a church, it was where I went to college, it was attached to a church, it had separated, but we still met in their facilities. And at that church, if you wanted to be a deacon in that church, you had to be a doctor, a lawyer, or a businessman, basically. When you want to be in leadership at a church, the only thing that ought to matter is, how, is whether A, you know Jesus Christ, of course, that ought to matter, but B, how much you have grown in Jesus Christ, how much you walk with Jesus Christ, your relationship with Jesus Christ, it's character, not race, talent, money, or social status. And when we come to the table of the Lord and we allow human differences, human grudges, or human things to divide us, we insult the Savior who died for our sins and rose to give us new life. Now listen, we cannot seek God's grace and at the same time disdain and exclude others who, who God loves and who God has saved. Shall I say that again? When you receive 
the love and grace of Jesus Christ, you lose the right to be exclusive over who you love in the body of Christ. Is there a fellow believer who has hurt you, insulted you, and aggravated you? And by the way, the answer to that question is yes. If you have been in the church any length of time, God saves annoying people. Don't give me an amen on that because they'll... Because you're the annoying person to someone else in this body of Christ. <laughs> if I asked, no, I'm not going to do it. I said, if I asked people to look at the person that annoyed, people would be looking at you probably. <laughs> it might be your husband or wife. Because we're sinners. <laughs> I like that. Bob had his Bible up like that back there. <laughs> Listen. God saves sinners. Guess what sinners do? They sin. They annoy. We're broken people. And so the body of Christ is always going to be a place of broken people. And we've tried to make it into this, you know, highfalutin place where we're all, we're so, we, I wish in some ways, and this boy, this goes against, this is practically heresy in a lot of Baptist churches, but I wish we, and, and here I am the only person wearing a suit and tie in here. But I do that because I tend to sweat when I preach and I don't want sweat stains to show, you know. That's classy. I know that's classy, folks. But uh, I, I wish we just, I, I wish we had come as you are, church, in some ways. I know that's, be, just because, I know, you know, we're supposed to give God our best and all that, but our best is not how we look, it's who we are. And, uh, the message of, of the Lord's Supper is if there's a fellow believer, now listen to this, this is good stuff. You better buckle up. If there's a fellow believer who has insulted you, hurt you, or aggravated you, tough cookies. You love those God saves. In the church, you don't love those you like, you love those God saves. And that's hard. That's hard. You say, oh, but, 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 but. No buts about it. Jesus said, return good for evil. You think he was kidding? Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for them. You think he was just having a bad day when he said that? He gave us no, no wiggle room on those commands. There's no room for cliques and factions in that. No schisms in the body of Christ. And as we come to the table of the Lord, we have to turn away from old grudges, from bitterness, from cliques, divisions, and factions. Absolutely, we need to examine our hearts. But the real issue in 1 Corinthians 11 is your relationship within the body of Christ. Are there grudges? Are there factions? Are there divisions? Now let's examine the rest of the passage. Verses 23-26 through 26, um, are the familiar words. I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus took the bread and gave thanks. This is my body which is for you. Do this in remember, remembrance of me. He took the cup after, cup after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he's saying, he said, this represents my body. And it's given for you and, and it bears the sins of the world. Now listen, we all, every human being, we turned our backs on God and we ran from Him. And that brought judgment on ourselves as human beings. Infinite judgment, eternal judgment. And only eternal separation from God under His judgment could pay the debt that our sins created. The only way to pay the debt that our sins created was eternal separation from God under His judgment. But Jesus had a different plan. He came into the world and He did the one thing none of us could ever do. He lived a sinless life. And at the end of His sinless life, He said, I will pay your debt. What could pay the debt? Separation from God under judgment. And He said, why have you forsaken Me, Father? He suffered our hell, our death. His sinless body bore our sins. He paid the price, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. And in a few moments, when you hold that wafer in your hands, remember that Jesus died for your sins, that His body bore your sins and the sins of the world. 
The cup represents the blood of Jesus Christ, which washed our sins white as the new fallen snow. Thank God that fallen snow is gone. But thank Him the next time that new fallen snow and it's white and pure and actually kind of beautiful when it first falls. But uh, thank God that, that your sins are washed away and hold that cup and remember that Jesus' blood removes the stain of sin that separates you and, my, and, he, and I from the Father and makes us right with Him. The Lord's Supper, communion, is a time of remembrance. It's a time to examine ourselves and reflect on what Jesus has done for us. And I've always tried to do that. To, to reflect on my relationship with God and renew my walk with Him. To refire my zeal for Him uh, if the embers have grown cold. That's important. You need to do that today. Uh, we should celebrate communion first Sunday of the month. And you know, don't start when the sermon ends. Start Sunday morning. Start during the week. You know it's coming. You know it's coming. Start preparing your heart and think about it. However, it's clear in this passage that the Lord's Supper is more than just self-reflection. We are warned to observe the Lord's Supper. And here's the key. To observe the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. Verse 27. Or we sin against the body and blood of Christ. If you do not observe the Lord's Supper today in a worthy manner, you are sinning against the body and blood of Christ. Now listen. Be thankful this morning that it doesn't say that you have to be worthy of observing the Lord's Supper. If it said be worthy of observing the Lord's Supper, I'd do you a favor. I'd pick up the bread and I'd pick up the cup and I'd take it in the other room and save you from sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. It doesn't say you have to be worthy. That's, what I, that's where I went wrong a lot of those times. The, you know, the elements would be passing like, I, I know I'm not worthy. I'm, I'm a little sinner. And again, I don't need the amens right now. You don't amen any of the good stuff I say. Oh, I'm a little sinner. Amen, pastor. But, but I knew I wasn't worthy. You will never be worthy. You don't have to be worthy. You have to observe the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. How do you do that? Verses 28 and 29. Let a person examine himself then. And eat, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. You take time to examine yourself. And anyone who eats and drinks without, now here's the key, discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Discerning the body. We examine ourselves before we eat the bread and drink the cup. And then it says we must discern the body. Now for a long time, I just assumed that meant thinking about the body and blood of Christ on the cross. But it never mentions the body and blood. It just says discerning the body. I think it's referring to the body of Christ. And it's talking about thinking about your relationship with the body of Christ. And as you come to the table, the table of the Lord, we don't, go, we don't take the elements and go home and celebrate the Lord's Supper. We do it together. Why? Why? Because as we come together, we remember what Jesus did for me, but we also remember what Jesus did for us. It's a group experience. And we are to discern our relationship with the body of Christ. And as you come to the table of the Lord, you need to ask yourself, how is my relationship with the body of Christ? As a whole, but especially this body of Christ that you celebrate communion with? Are you living in unity with the body of Christ? Or are there people that you need as you... You know, Jesus actually talked about leaving your gift at the altar and going and making it right with someone and then coming back. Uh, I don't know that you have to leave and go and come back if the Lord convicts you to do that. Maybe you should. I think generally, as you just covenant in your heart, if there's someone you know you need to get... And by the way, let me say something, and this is totally... Stop the clock. Don't ever confess... Let's say that I, I'm holding a grudge against Dale. I only say that, I pick on Dale, because I don't have a grudge against Dale, okay? I want that to be really clear. I'm not working out some issue. But I'm holding a grudge against Dale... 
And he and I haven't had words. I've just been holding a grudge. And so what I do is I go to him and say, Dale, I just want to confess that I've been holding a grudge against you for several years. I haven't even known him for several years, but I've been holding a grudge against you and I want to confess that and make it right. You know what that is? That's an accusation against him. That's sort of a passive-aggressive way of telling him I've been mad at him. That's not a way to solve it. If I have a grudge against him and we haven't been fighting, all I do is confess my grudge to God and get it right. Now, if Dale and I have been yelling at each other and cussing each other out and fighting, then I go to him and say, hey, brother, we need to, I'd like to get this right and I'd like to apologize. I'd like to confess my sin and get this right with you. If we've had a fight, but if I've just had bad feelings towards him, I don't go and confess that to him because then that starts a fight. That doesn't finish a fight. He goes away thinking, what on earth did I ever do to him? I've had people come to me and do that. They've come to me and said, Dave, I want to confess. And I, I, I thought we were good buddies and I, I've, I've been holding a grudge against you. I'm like, what did I ever do? Because you know, this face. and this. It's like, what did I ever do? And so from then on, I was uncomfortable. About, it created a problem where none existed. So unless you know there's a problem between you, don't confess sin. The the old line is confession should be as public as the sin. If you've sinned against that person, in your heart, confess in your heart. If you've sinned publicly, if you fought with that person, then confess it publicly. Okay, back to my sermon. Clock starts again. What I want to do as we draw near to the end here I want to share some random thoughts really quickly uh, about a worthy celebration of the supper. And uh, I'm just going to run through these basically a sentence at a time, and I really don't have time to elaborate on them. But number one, you cannot celebrate the Lord, and there's seven of these, and I, I will not elaborate on them. Number one, you cannot celebrate the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner unless you belong to the Lord, unless you're part of the body of Christ. Listen, you can eat all of the the bread, the wafers that we have, and drink every one of these cups. It will not save you. Celebrating communion in a Baptist church, a Methodist church, a Presbyterian church, a Catholic church, that's pretty much all we got in town here. It won't save you. You don't eat and drink communion, Lord's Supper, Mass, whatever, to get to heaven. You eat the Lord's Supper because you're going to heaven. It's a memorial of what Christ has already done for you. But if you haven't trusted Christ, you can do that right now. You can just say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I want you as my Lord and Savior. And then, man, table's open to remember what Christ just now did for you. Uh, Second, The basis of a worthy celebration is being right with God and trusting Him, not how righteous you are. Listen, if you walked in here today with a load of guilt and sin, you can confess that, boom, and it's done. Because it's not about how great you are, it's about how great your God is. And all it takes is repentance and recommitment. Whether it's about your relationships within the body of Christ or your own personal walk with Him. Because this is about what Jesus did for you, not how great you are. So all that guilt I would have when I was a kid, I'm like, oh, I'm not really walking with God. That's not what it's about. It's not how much you walk with God. It's what Jesus did for you. But you've got to come with a heart of humility and repentance and say, Lord, remake me, remold me. Three, this is important. Your job right now is you. The Bible says examine yourself and not think about everybody else's fault. If you're thinking, boy, my husband really needs to hear this message, or I hope my wife is listening, or I wish my kids were hearing this, that's not what it's about. It's about examining yourself. When you come to the table of the Lord, it's about examining me. It's about you examining you. Number four, I already mentioned this, but you don't get to choose your family. You're called to love and accept everyone God saves. The body of Christ is chosen by God's love, not our preferences. God saves difficult people. He saves people with problems, broken people, and those people need love. We're not a country club with exclusive membership. 
We're a hospital for sinners. And as we come to the table, you ask yourself, have I lived up to that ideal? Have I loved the broken people that God saved? I remember one time, I don't always hear voices in my head. And I don't always hear God's voice. But one time I remember, I don't have time for this, but I remember hearing God speak to my, well, stomp on my heart would be closer to it. I, I was driving home, I think from soccer practice, I was a coach. And I saw a lady walking on the side of the street. And she wasn't just heavy. She was morbidly, I mean, this, this, was, this was one of those women that would have been on my 600-pound life. You know, I'm saying she'd have been on TV. And she was dressed shabbily. And I just, I remember, and I, I, this is inappropriate of me to even say this, but I, you have to get the idea. And as I, I, as I drove past her, I just kind of looked at her and kind of went, <laughs> you know, and I disdained her in my heart. I was by myself. I didn't say anything to anyone else. And I just remember the Holy Spirit just crushing me. How dare you disdain somebody for whom Jesus died? Just, if you remember wrestling, lowered the Dusty Rhodes bionic elbow on my soul. You know what? I was probably 350 pounds at the time, so it wasn't like I was any, you know, great physical specimen or anything but the spirit just said how dare you well that's what the lord's supper is about you're broken too i've seen that over and over again where some new family would join the church and i'd be like finally another normal person in the church (laughs) and then i'd get to know them and i'd realize they're just as broken as the rest of us they're, they have just as much trouble as the rest of us. Because everyone's, everyone's broken. We had to rename our churches. Di- First Dysfunctional Baptist Church. Now you just want me to move on, don't you? Number five, you'll love this one. Nothing anyone else ever does in any slight way ever justifies at all any divisive behavior on your part, Ever. See, when I'm divisive, I can always say, well, it was his fault or it was her fault. She started it. He started it. Nothing anyone else ever does, ever in any slight way, ever (laughs) justifies at all any divisive behavior on my part. If I'm divisive, I don't care who started it. I'm responsible before Jesus Christ. We're commanded to love those who hurt us, forgive them, and to seek to restore fellowship. Number six. A worthy celebration focuses on the cross of Jesus Christ and asks the question, is my life a fitting response to what Christ did there? Did Jesus suffer and die on the cross so that I could live the life I'm living right now? And number seven, a worthy celebration of the cross focuses on the body of Christ and asks the question, am I in a right relationship with the body of Christ. Am I in a right relationship with Christ? Am I in a right relationship with His body? Those are the questions we need to ask. Are there people that I may need to commit today to seek to restore fellowship with? To love and to walk with? Thank God that people like you and me who can never be worthy of the glories of heaven can celebrate the grace of God in a worthy manner by reveling in what Jesus Christ has done for us. He bore our sins, and He bled to wash away those sins, and we can revel in what Christ has done. So we need to take these next few minutes to remember what Jesus Christ has done. Father in heaven, I pray, I pray that You would Move in our hearts right now. Where there, is, where there is sin in our lives, I pray that You, thanking You that the blood of Jesus Christ washes those sins away. Where there is 
where there are grudges, anger, issues from the past, whatever it is, I pray that you would give us hearts of love and grace that would restore fellowship with one another in Jesus' wonderful and blessed name. Amen.